Okay. <laughs> How many of these videos are going to start with? Okay. That's the <laughs> great intro. Um, I want to jump into Freaked. Obviously, there's a lot more to look at with the Circle K stuff. Um, we're definitely going to look at Iron Eagle and Gung Ho and Out of Africa. But because this stack is actually so uh, dense, I'm just feeling the need to sort of rest my brain from it for a little bit. So let's do that by looking at another crazy thing, <laughs> uh, which is Freaked. Uh, the DVD is yet to arrive. Um, but that's good, actually, because when I get the DVD, I'm just going to want to look at all the special features right away and all that kind of stuff. So we can get to some kind of an overview of what this movie is uh, before that happens. And I'm not going to even pretend to have anything like an organized approach here um, because I'm I just don't know what's going on in this movie. Like, I mean, that's not true. I've watched it many times and have mapped out a lot of stuff in it, but it is so complicated and uh, it's very much like an active area of research. So, so. I just kind of want to watch the whole thing, maybe, or just watch some of it, I don't know. Um, and we'll take it. I, I don't think bots are on the prowl for this. You can actually watch this whole thing on YouTube if you search for it. Um, you know, it's a pretty lousy fidelity copy, but uh, it's good. This copy is excellent. Um, I made a point of downloading the big one. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, let's just take it at let's just take it at point five. That's pretty good for talking over. So this opens with this amazing um, title sequence. It's all claymation. Made by an artist, I believe, named uh, David Daniels, maybe. Um, I mean, look at it. It's just... It's like one continuous... Um, lump of clay. We're looking at it in profile here. Um, it has, oh gosh, why is this doing this? Come on. Now we have to back up. We don't want to miss a single glorious frame of this opening. Um, Um, so here's the clay and then there's like, you know, a structure in it, which so like, here's that face coming out the front of it. Um, but then it's kind of like animated like that. And then it slices are cut out of it. Am I explaining that well at all? <laughs> it's kind of a little hard to understand, but you can see the, the effect of it is so amazing and psychedelic. I think we're listening to um, Henry Rollins here. This stuff is so cool at speed, or like, you know, like at tempo. <laughs> Maybe, um, maybe we should look at this part at 1x. I mean, look at that, it's just electric. That is amazing. Hold on, let's take that one back. Oh, where are we now?
here, let's uh Look at the way that just clunks together. So that's our first glimpse of Stewie, this really strange character. <laughs> So cool. Cowboy. <laughs> As Elijah, uh, there's just so much to say about this movie. It's gonna take forever. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just obsessed with everything about this movie, pretty much. Like, I'm obsessed with the soundtrack. I'm obsessed with all the effects work. And obviously I'm obsessed with the ground, which is full of amazing Red Twins material. Now, this is another film that contains many of these handed matches. In fact, this was a film that I discovered kind of at the same time that I was really putting together the match stuff. With Hellraiser 3 and just in the kind of aftermath of that. Funny how these things materialize. Seemingly at just the right moments. Look at this weird thing. You know, what is this? It's just a two headed thing. And then we get this. So you see, I wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't completely weird and unreasonable of me <laughs> to perceive um, uh, a strange double-headed chicken thing in the um, in the Hellraiser material. Do I still have that? I think maybe I even still have that screen cap here. Back here maybe somewhere. Yeah, you see, <laughs> it does kind of end up looking like that. I really think it does, which is very funny because it's a. I'm not sure how to describe this. You know, a lot of synchronicity, it just seems like it's so much about the position of the viewer, you know? It's like relative to where the camera is and relative to how the human brain works, at least how mine does, this ends up looking like, I don't know, like two heads with little red tops and some kind of weird neck and then like a shared body thing down here. I don't know. <laughs> It's like another weird projection air, like space kind of um, kind of thing. Wow, I'm doing such a good job managing the English language right now. <laughs> I think I'm feeling a little scatterbrained today. It's just has been a lot. You may return to your homes. Just a lot on my mind, I guess. But. Back to the sky, Daily so okay, so. We just heard a thing about the, the flying gimp having been destroyed. That's a tie-in to this thing called the Idiot Box. Um, which was a video series um, done by Alex Winter and some other people. It's like a comedy sketch thing on MTV. And Flying Gimp was one of the characters in that show. So... <laughs> You can see, like, the kind of movie we're in for already. It just opens with a really obscure reference that nobody in the audience is going to get, probably, and very proudly, you know. 
I love that kind of thing. Let's turn this up a little bit. Um, mean you, man! I got a really big soft spot for Henry Rollins. We repeat, the flying gimp has been destroyed. You may return to your homes. So it opens with this strange talk show. I think this is very important. Um, So, this is our introduction to Ricky Coogan. We're introduced to him in silhouette. We're told that he's been hideously disfigured and that he's been through some kind of an ordeal. And we see here that he is horribly disfigured. Um, well, this ends up becoming part of a really weird joke, which maybe I'll talk about in a second. Or maybe I'll talk about it later. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I suppose it makes sense to just talk about this up front. I mean, why not? Um, a huge piece of context here is... Alex Winter, you know, was a child actor. Come on. I'm trying to exit full screen here. So, on February 2nd, 2018, Winter revealed that he was molested by an older man at age 13 while he was acting on Broadway. So, I think you'll end up agreeing with me, probably, that this film is clearly about this situation in some way. And I don't remember exactly where, but I read an interview with Alex at some point where he said that... Um, that this film was was about, you know, experiences to do with being a child actor. Um, so it's a comedy, but there's serious stuff right beneath the surface. Um, it's just interesting that it opens with a talk show and, you know, and that it's a character that's an actor. And also, the name Coogan well, There is actually some Richard Coogan, that's interesting Captain Video Huh, I wonder if this is the reference then I was thinking of the child actor um, for whom the bill is named, right, the Coogan bill, um, Jackie Coogan. Maybe it's a funny double reference, I don't know. I think in the context of, of the read I want to attempt, that th uh, this is a film with um, psychological subtext to do with this abuse and with sort of 
child child acting in general. I don't know. Um, I think this is this is an obvious thought here. So Charlie Chaplin <laughs> orbiting around this again. Um, I think there are very obvious parallels to the Wizard of Oz in this piece. And so we'll be looking at the Wizard of Oz a little bit. And I find that quite interesting because, you know, the, the Wizard of Oz was built on the abuse of Judy Garland, who was, you know, pumped full of amphetamines during that production. Uh, and also probably molested during that production. Uh, these are this is a major shadow of <laughs> the Wizard of Oz and uh, uh, you know MGM as a studio uh, and just old Hollywood in general. Um, there was really a, a pretty systematic abuse of of actors in general, actually, but child actors especially and most um, <laughs> heinously. Um, so I want to bring all that stuff in as we read this. And also as we read this, I want to be very sensitive to the fact that Alex Winter is a person who is still alive. <laughs> and, uh, and some of the material that we can see here was maybe unconscious for him when he made this piece. It sounds like it probably isn't for him anymore. Um, but I just want to be I don't want to be too flippant with the with that aspect of the material here. I, I think that it's a little bit rude in a way to psychoanalyze a living person from a distance like this. So I want to kind of avoid that. But at the same time, um, I want to understand this piece that he's made. Uh, and he did make this piece. <laughs> uh, and so I, I think we need to be able to relate it to his bio a little bit. So it's just going to be a bit of a balancing act uh, as we look at it to make sure that um, that we're thinking freely and also, of course, precisely, but also um, sensitively and with some empathy. So, so I'm going to reveal what the joke is right away, actually, because it's it's hysterical and I think it's important and will help us understand what's going on. Um, and anyway, you know, uh, I hope that you're not hanging around here if, if spoilers are a thing that you care about, both in terms of these movies and in terms of the mystery, although, of course, the mystery can't really be spoiled, but. Uh, come on now. Maybe we'll just pick it up from here. Dead meat. <laughs> Dead meat. Okay. That's my story. <laughs> and that's my story. Ooh, it's so exciting. We Everyone's asleep. Boy. It's so interesting to Oh, it's about time. Tr so they said we fixed Coogan's light. <laughs> you know, it's like they set it up. I, I just think this is so fun. By the way, I'm going to. I'm not going to make it like I'm going to laugh at so much stuff in this movie. It's just I really think it's a funny movie. Um, so they set it up so that you think they've deliberately silhouetted him to like protect his identity or just so that you can't see the horrible disfigurement or something. But then at the end, they're just like it was actually like a technical problem. So now they're going to throw the light on. But look what it's <laughs> it's like a cactus in the background, like. He's not disfigured in any way, you know, it's I think that is so funny, but it's also so strange because it it's a joke that relies on. Or not even rely, you know, 
how exact, but it just it makes direct use of a figure ground conflation thing. <laughs> so it really is like pay attention to the ground. And then in this film, there's so much conscious stuff worked into the ground. I mean, we're just going to have, or anyway, I'm going to have <laughs> at any rate, like a ton of fun documenting all of the little Easter eggs and, uh, and actually just like jokes that occur in the ground. It's funny that this is a very advanced film in, in my mind, because there are jokes that are playing out in the figure and then like <laughs> parallel jokes running in the ground or even kind of disconnected freeform things running around in the ground uh, that are, I don't know, just really often quite smart and very funny. Um, so, okay, skipping back here. I have no familiarity with like the overall structure of this really like where things are, so. There might be a lot of aimless scrubbing. After your horrific ordeal, <laughs> the very mention of your name makes children scream in terror. Ricky Coogan. <laughs> the world is... So... You know, it's a joke, but right in the first, I mean, excluding the title sequence, in the first minute, basically, of this film, we're talking about screaming children and then we hear screaming children. You know, the voices of screaming I find that somewhat ghostly there, especially at half speed. Also, isn't it hilarious that Brooke Shields is in this somehow? It's waiting to hear your story. It's like the whole joke. It's, the casting is really funny. In well, this it's kind of long, but... It's hilarious because it's not like it clearly is attached to him here. <laughs> I don't know. They like very deliberately mislead you. I find that amusing. Okay. It all started when I was approached to be spokesman for a multinational corporation called EES. So yeah, EES. Um, the first thing I'll say about it, um, for, for people who have been following for a while and remember all the Gremlins analysis, is that EES really reminds me of Clamp. Clamp Cable Network, right? That was it, I think, CCN. Oh, the everything except shoes people. It's just some kind of... I don't know what this is. <laughs> A joke, but weird. Like, I keep thinking about this. There's some meaning to this, potentially. I don't really know. Um, but so... Maybe I want to open Gremlins quickly here. Gremlins to the new batch. These are subtitles. <laughs> I don't want the subtitles, thank you very much. Um, that's the sample of the session. Okay. So let's see if we can find You know, okay, so why we have this uh, why while we have this open yeah, CCN. Let's talk a little bit about the handedness of this first stack here. The death of Mr. Wayne removes the last obstacle to developer Daniel Clamps. Probably.
just by doing this, I've made more copyright headaches for myself. I hate this whole situation. But right, so uh, we all remember this, right? We have um, red twins, so signed. Um, one hand at nine, this hand would extend up to 11. So 9-11 picked out on the clock. And then we have 116 um, picked out over here on the lower left-hand side. So it's quite a bit like the Back to the Future tableau where we get the fiery 911 on this side. I made a lot of that in the analysis. You know that we have, we get we get the number twice there, 116, and then it's also picked out on the clock. 88. Um, she has the microphone, so. And then obviously her hair also carries the explosion, since the explosion is a little bit jumbled here. Um, but this, but the two red twins and I don't know, you know, hands and bright red and yellow and green and white. It's all um, Atomic Kid color space match. Shop, which once housed many rare He's putting up a character here. I'm not sure what it says. Or taking it down, maybe. There's a hammer here. Inverted interesting stuff going on here. Um, but but the whole image is sort of like you know, we get the another red twins instance on this on this side. Oh, pretty pretty great. And then here as well on this side of the Buddha head, so that you know. Two candles. You know, what side is that on? <laughs> what side is that on? So we're seeing there's some extra dimensionality in this scene that we weren't aware of before. Okay. I don't want to, um, whoops. Well, you know, maybe that's an invitation to do that here. Let's take the angle. This one's gonna be very hard to get anything on because it's so wide. Thirty-four, you know. We could claim it's one hundred thirty-seven. I don't know. It's, there's, there's too much gif here to make any kind of reasonable calculation. It's kind of like weird animals over here. Okay. Um, I was trying to find clamp stuff. Mainly just like clamp's office. Uh. Oh man, I don't remember the structure here. Where are we? There's clamp. Okay, here okay, this is this is quite fine. I just wanted to kind of get that in our brains a little bit. So that we can see the um the similarity. Chairman and the board of directors. The one 
wanted to send me to South America to promote a controversial fertilizer called Zygrot 24. You are the only one who can stand up to these radicals who are trying to keep Zygrot 24 from the struggling farmers whose very future depends on it. Wasn't that stuff banned? Only in the U.S. And Europe. I heard that shit's lethal. All right, you need proof. Fine. Please sit. I would like you to meet the head of our South America. So, we've been learning about Zygrot 24. Also, what am I doing here? Am I actually going to commit to doing like a full scene by scene analysis of this? I don't really want to do that exactly. But there's a lot of stuff stacked up right here at the beginning. So I do kind of want to go through the first, like, I don't know, 10 minutes of this movie linearly, I think. Um, I moved the computer, so now the volume is going to be different on my voice, probably. This is a really weird scene. I don't know exactly what to say about this scene. <laughs> First of all, there's just a lot of interesting um, object detail here. I'm quite interested in these, this, and this whole weird thing. Thumbs up to Ricky Coogan and EES. This thing is such a monolith. I think that's probably deliberate, but why exactly? <laughs> Everything except shoes, you know, shoes. Ground you to the earth. I don't know. I'm not going to attempt some symbolic reading of that yet. Um, Do you think he's very Trump like? It's weird. Senor Juan Valdez. So, this is George Ramirez, <laughs> who. Uh, what even is the name of that character? I'm just going to call him Clamp. Uh, as immediately, like, confused with someone else. Then very weird things happen. He's been working with Zagrat 24 every day for the last five years. I'm looking. He's in fine shape. Aren't you? Juan. This actor is amazing, like, the rage burning beneath the surface here, you know? <laughs> it's communicated very effectively. And then the repression of it. Yes. I am fine. <laughs> but he's not fine. He's boiling. I want you to know Santa Flan set a flat. What kind of shitty name for a country is that? 
It's interesting that they join in in this mockery. Also, this is a very weird collection of folk, isn't it? Um, at some point, I do want to take a look at the script. I don't want to do that right now, but um, the characters all have names. Uh, I think, let's see if I can remember. Personal trainer, bodyguard, I forget what this guy's called, but it's something like a life coach or <laughs> some kind of guru, you know. Uh, that's maybe the publicist. I don't know. We'll have to look it up later and confirm. Telephone. Cigarette. Cigarette. Hand. 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 Here's a hand, but the other hands are all kind of obscured, so. Yeah, a little bit, huh? So, you know, it's beginning here. Um, this film, like I said, it gives us so many of them. I think it's it's probably comparable to Hellraiser. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see as we go through. Poor George. Something I'll say about the script. Well, we'll have to wait till we get to this part of the scene, I guess. It's named for the patron saint of creamy desserts. <laughs> I think this guy is genuinely enjoying the performance, you know? <laughs> Everyone else is trying not to laugh. Uh, patron saint of creamy desserts. Santa Flan. Yeah, you know, these are all jokes, but it's like they're just mocking everything about George, you know? His whole identity and where he comes from. And and we've just seen that he's maybe maybe a religious man, and they're mocking that as well. Um this is meant to be Pretty clearly, you know, Ricky Coogan in his pre-individuated state here. Um, he's not yet a freak or doesn't know he's a freak. Um, and he is just, you know, full of judgment for other people. <laughs> and perfectly happy to um, do business with EES. Um, even though we learned that Zygrot 24, uh, is toxic. And well, actually, Zygrot 24 is a very complicated symbol in this piece. Ah, oh, fuck. And to understand this piece, we also have to look at Mac and me, because there's this whole weird thing with product placement in this that... I'm still sort of struggling to really understand myself, so it's I'm just gonna have to kind of slog through it, I guess. Um, As I was saying, we have worked very closely with Cyclone Twenty Four. I have personally supervised its development. <laughs> So, 
he's been replaced with another actor. And then this happens again. So that's the final form. <laughs> How to think about what's even happening here. You see what I mean? How weird is this? Like, we're in such a strange space now. I kind of thought that maybe they were trying to do like a like a shrink effect because it's like he's been supervising the development of the zygrot which is a mutagenic that's not a word you know uh it's it's like this toxic sludge that makes people into mutants in this movie and so i thought the joke was maybe like okay he he's a mutant and he's like shrinking in real time. And instead of doing a real effect, <laughs> you know, they just like did a very coarse shrink by swapping out like the actors in stages. Um, but then in the script, it just, it just describes like, it just literally says like, George is replaced with a different actor every time we cut back. And it just describes this exact, like, thing in perfect detail. There's really not much difference between what's in, in the script and what's in the film at all, except that um, a whole lot of stuff got cut from the film, which is why I'm so excited to get this DVD, because actually a ton of that stuff in the script was actually shot. This didn't make it into the theatrical cut. Um... Anyway, I do think there's some kind of thing that, like, they're... Mockery of him infantilizes him, so he's, he's like a strange little baby or child now. Um, which they've emphasized by, with this oversized suit, you know? I definitely think that Mr. EES, <laughs> this is really a problem that I don't remember this guy's name. Here, let's get the Wikipedia article up. Um, I really feel that he's the butt of the joke here, I think. Um, ugh, I don't want to magnify it. Uh, Dick Bryan is the name of this character, I guess. It, this is kind of funny. Maybe it's like, you know, like Dick for brains or something. I don't know. Weird. So, okay. That's Dick, I guess. Mitch. Ours.
a weird shot. Well, Ricky, what do you say? Are you EES's man in San Juan? Excuse me. So the deal Okay, so just I'm just trying to keep a little bit of a context floating here. We open with This talk show, and then that goes into this sort of flashback narrative where Ricky Coogan takes this, you know, job to become the spokesman of EES to hawk Zygrot 24 uh, in South America somewhere in this fictional place. Santa Flan. And so he's on a plane en route to Santa Flan. <laughs> some joke about a weird movie we'll look at uh, at some point here. This guy. I was Ricky Coogan, toxic chemical salesman. Me and my buddy Ernie hopped on the next plane for Santa Flan. I also like how there's no context about who or what Ernie is or how they know each other. This is my buddy Ernie, and then he just shows up out of nowhere with the weirdest prop. Like, here, you'll see it in a second. Oh, did they show a movie? Return to the Blue Lagoon. Oh, I heard that sucked. Return to the Blue Lagoon looks truly weird. <laughs> we'll check it out at some point. So we're on this plane now, and look at, just immediately we have a rose, and some kind of weird, um, come on, let's go on here. Well, it is just being annoying, isn't it? All right, now I don't know what, whoops. What that is, maybe it's just a pen, I guess. Um. I guess that's a pen, but it's definitely um, a little antenna-like, I think, combined with the clock. Well, and then here's the rose, and then in the background we have two red rectangles. So you might think, yeah, okay, it's a little weak though, huh? Well, it just builds and builds and builds in intensity here. <laughs> this is one that I think, you know, I'm just gonna kinda, I'm just gonna roll through it step by step and note it, note note the, the features as it goes. Okay, so here comes Ernie. And the first <laughs> his face. <laughs> the first thing we see Ernie do is he's just basically like assaulting people with this <laughs> rubber hand attached to his fly. Two palm trees here. Red. 
This is interesting because it kind of looks like a flower and like an explosion. And of course it looks like, you know, sperms and an egg. It's Red Hot Chili Peppers shirt. It's striped. Corduroy. It's even extra striped. Like, what kind of way to introduce a character is this? <laughs> it's so funny. He smells the rose. So first of all, we're gaining in sort of <laughs> hollowed up dimensional structure here because we have another rose creeping in, in the ground. So that rose aligns with that red rectangle. And that rose aligns with that red rectangle. And now also we have a hand over here and this weird thing that's like a flower or like a sex explosion or something. Red hot hand coming from the genitals. Then we already had, you know, we saw the clock over here and the pen. So. It's just like... Very strange, isn't it? I, uh, you know... I don't know. I've been on a lot of planes, you know? Uh, I grew up in Israel and did a lot of flying back and forth between Israel and the United States, oftentimes via Europe. And, um, and I've been, you know, I've traveled elsewhere around the world since then and so on. So it's like, I, you know, I've never seen anything like this on a plane that's weird. What is this? It's just a, it's just a rose sitting there on the, like, you know, okay. Odd, pretty odd. There's alcohol here and it's this hand. How does a rubber hand, this joke doesn't even make sense, you know, like, <laughs> Okay, so we're about to meet Stewie. Stewie is here in the luggage compartment. <laughs> now, Stewie definitely represents, perhaps amongst other things, Ricky's inner child they really develop that in a pretty explicit way in this film. So it's, it's <laughs> there's really no interpretation necessary. It's Ricky's inner child. Um, so it's interesting that everyone reacts to it, <laughs> it, you know, uh, with such horror. And they describe Stewie as a troll and so on. I think this is how a lot of us feel about our inner child. We're quite embarrassed by certain regions of our youth, you know. Is that your luggage up there? Yeah. Yeah. Is that your ugly little troll? Stewie, clock! <laughs> so here comes Stewie. Stewie appears in compartment number nine. I find that notable. Mm. 
<laughs> I, I just want to say right now, I am completely obsessed with this kid. Like, what a hilarious actor. His his timing and delivery and everything is so great. And I'm not sure I fully understand the parody here. Um, you know, he has prosthetic ears. <laughs> I'm pretty sure these are prosthetic teeth. I'm 100% sure, actually. Um, they've made him look like a mad magazine caricature or something like that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hilarious, though. And so, and so the whole thing is Stewie is Ricky's biggest fan. Right? Which is, I think, what the inner child is like a little bit, maybe. Anyway, I find it just a very endearing idea. Like, he just thinks everything that Ricky does is great. And, uh, Ricky more or less completely rejects him. Cool. So now there's this weird situation. <laughs> Alex's face. Uh, We have mentioned <laughs> it's like trace of Stewie, like toilets as a as an interesting potential resonator for the atomic kid. Comes Stewie here. Look at this picture. Yeah, so it's definitely handed. This big red element here. Aluminum, aluminum. Time in a skull, you know, to me it implies the, whoops. To me it implies the death of time. Or redhead on the plane with this Zygrot 24 thing that then has very strange numerical properties. Oops. So it calculates to 117 if you if you do it that way, but you see how the two groups form a one 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 and a six. Remember, does that sum anything in total? Yeah, and then it hits 118 on the reverse, so it's pretty close. Um, I, I find that pretty impressive in terms of the gematria space there. I love how that works out that. Zygrot hits 111, and then 24 hits, creates 6. And they're separated by a dash there, so, you know, I think it, 
I don't know, to me, as a, as a numerology uh, weirdo, the fact that we can substitute that here. I find that, I find that pretty remarkable. He's <laughs> doing this, like, to be good. pretend smushing Stewie's no. head. I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Catch a little bit of his reflection there, it's interesting. Okay. Wish that we could see the back of that thing a little more clearly. Almost looks like a cigarette ad. Can't quite tell. In any case, something quite amazing happens here. Look at all these funny objects that seem to, like, magnetically collide with Stewie. <laughs> it's like literally collide with them. We have another one of these roses. Two bottles of champagne, maybe. And two Pepsi cans. I'm pretty confident IDing those as Pepsi cans. Um, Cause we have the, I kind of perceive the um, red and blue swirl there. It's very hard with the motion blur. Um, here, let's take this super slow. So it goes by really quick. Yeah, those are definitely Pepsi cans. I find this so weird. Also, these two now form a um, handed pair. We have the two sets of twin towers with a rose that then immediately fall. You know, they collapse there. And Stewie then collides with the rose. All of this happening on a plane. See things like this, I instantly think Sagittarius, right? Now it looks like they've kind of glued these down or something so that they don't fall. Like, isn't that funny? What's the... point of it. Like the movie point of it, you know? I don't get it. Seems like it's there purely to make everything work in the context of the constellation. Here's another sense here of, you know, this is a chair, so legs go here. And then here's the communication tower. <laughs> 
And he gets blown out of the... <laughs> I was about to say airlock, as if this was a, uh, you know, spacefaring uh, vessel. But uh, out of the door. I think that's some kind of rainbow element that shoots after him. And then a guy in a wheelchair, which I always think of as, you know, to me this is Saturn, maybe. So I feel like there's kind of a Sagittarius Saturn energy here a little bit. So that's not the last we're going to see of Stewie. Okay, now they clink their drinks together. We're back here in this strange alignment with the hand and the rose. I find it interesting that the rose is aligned with a packet of peanuts here. This is significant due to um, certain tableaus we'll look at in Mac and Me. Peanuts, you know, there's something planted that we'll think about all this stuff. But, but look what's appeared in the background here. This rose is now aligned with a bomb of, re you know, red, made of red dynamite. So look at this line like you know red rose bomb hand another rose alcohol two red rectangles in the ground we just saw all this weirdness with the bottles colliding into Stewie who came out of compartment nine May I take your bomb, sir? It's pretty funny. <laughs> I love this guy's face. talking about left versus right. <clears throat> Is that number 11 up there? Looks like it. The Grand Canyon. <clears throat> Does make me think of like hemispheric divide. Come on. Panic-stricken little trolls. Let's do it again. I like how he's holding up an image of Ricky here. Falls into a haystack, essentially. 
maybe not into it, but just right next to it. I think that's part of the joke is that he misses it, you know. <laughs> but I find this very funny because of the idea of the needle in the haystack. You know? It's like... Stewie, as a, our weird sort of 9-11 resonating redhead, is a rare drop, <laughs> as it were. Falls right next to a cow, and then later we have this character called Cowboy that makes some remarks about Stewie. So, we do have a red barn with a red roof here. So, the idea that maybe... <clears throat> excuse me, Stewie with his red hair might connect to a building with a red top is suggested there. Note Stewie's red shoes. I would say perhaps the first of our sort of subtle Wizard of Oz connections here. palms of his hands like that. What a great actor. <laughs> so then we cut from that to another shot of a plane. And then we see this plane explode. So, Santa Spam, loud music, hot sex, meet, kind of, I don't know, Dionysian dancing. <laughs> And then again, like hot sex. So these are all things we associate to this region of the frame and to the imagery and the reference object. And then we see, we see, and then we see a plane explode. So all those things in the dialogue occur in time with an image of a plane exploding, immediately following all of that material we had with all the weirdness on the plane. multiple, you know, you can almost call that a match. Sure glad that wasn't our plane. <laughs> so it's just some other plane that blew up. See, that is so funny because they put that stuff in the ground with the bomb. And so then when you see that plane blow up, you assume that it connects to that. But then it doesn't. <laughs> okay. okay, but this completes our handedness here. This big sort of 
Back to the Future looking van just explodes over here on this side. And over here we have our tower resonating structures, or north tower resonating structures. I love how this guy, um, come on, I think we're, um, losing some of the image here, hold on. How this guy's head just aligns perfectly with the explosion and then the red flower stuff around his neck. Here are all these protesters. Suck shit. <laughs> I do like the I like I guy confusedly standing there. It's pretty funny. So this dude's just standing around back here with the bomb completely <laughs> intact. So then they follow up on their weird Jo like expectation subverting joke with another statement in the ground to let you know to really make the point that those two things don't connect isn't that weird though then how this whole joke then revolves around a very strong implication of a causal connection that then emerges as completely acausal. It's just an accident. Some other plane blew up, and this is just a guy who is an upstanding citizen who happens to be a bomb enthusiast or something. He's going to, like, a bomb convention. <laughs> you know, who knows? I have no idea. We never see this again. This is just some weird joke they put kind of slightly in the ground. But, you know, he's standing right in front of the thing that did blow up again, so it's all strange and maintains the handedness here. And then, you know, that this whole weird joke that is about a causal implication extracted from the ground that then manifests in an acausal image at the same time that we have all this weirdness with this red head. <sighs> Come on. Uh, anyway, complete my thought there. That whole thing then, it's amazing that, that the actual material there, that the content there is then an exploding plane and a bomb and all of this. In this image context that then, you know, has the rose and the hand and another rose and the bomb. Okay, so here we have some kind of anima moment. Really weird fire. Two firefighters show up back here with yellow hats. To, like, it's amazing that there's that level of care. Look, then they, they keep it running back there. Now they're on top, you know. <laughs> they could have easily not done this, but they've taken the time to really orchestrate it precisely. Lady in a red dress appears in the deep background there. I do find it notable that this red blood stain appears on that side of his head. Okay, this sign that says drink Pepsi is the o only remaining remnant, other than the Pepsi cans that collide into Stewie, of this huge running joke about Pepsi and product placement that exists in the script but isn't in the film. Um, 
we'll talk about that more at some point because I want to argue that the zygrot is symbolic actually of product placement and more generally of organized content in the ground. We'll get to all this. It's a complicated symbol with some contradictory meanings, in fact, uh, you know, as usual. Um, you know, we saw a few strong matchy things, but most of that is still ahead of us. I think I'm going to break for tonight. Um, that felt pretty comfortable to just sort of um, talk through, you know, 10 minutes of this. Um, you know, maybe we'll just take it 10 minutes at a time. Um, I probably will just will just go ahead and document myself looking at the Freak DVDs. Maybe I won't release that stuff right away. Maybe I'll put that up after we get through a little more of this film or something. I don't know. We'll figure it all out. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for now. All right. Well, thanks everyone for hanging once again. And, uh, See you in the probably very near future.